All right, everyone is just funneling in from the waiting room now. So welcome everybody and thank you for joining us. And before I do introductions and a welcome, I just wanna let all of you know that you won't see yourselves on the screen. You won't be able to unmute or start your videos. And that's because we're going to record this session. So there's nothing wrong with your computer. Um, we'll re-enable those options at the end of the presentation toward the question and answer set. And we still have some people joining us. So welcome everybody who's still coming in. Welcome, welcome. All right. So I'd like to just welcome everybody today and thank you all for registering. Um, and for everyone who asked in advance if we're recording this, yes, if it's if it's not apparent already, we are recording this. Um, for later use. Um, this is an information session titled, What is the Bucks County Co-Responder Program? Um, and this serves as an information session so that all of you have a basis of knowledge for what it is that this program is, um, how many people it served, um, what the goals of the program are, and where we hope to go with this. And I hope that all of you joining are empowered to help the county um, and our local police departments and these awesome co-responders advocate to uh, make this a countywide initiative. So joining me today and as my co-host is our Director of Human Services, Rachel Neff. And I'm going to turn it over to you to get everything started, Rachel. Thank you so much for doing this. Great. So thank you, Nick. Um, we are really looking forward to the presentation this afternoon. So first, we just want to say thank you to NAMI hosting this series on mental health uh, throughout Bucks County, I think is a really important endeavor. So thanks so much for all the work that NAMI does throughout Bucks County. And, and thank you for the invitation. Um, so we are going to get started. Uh, I would like the panel who's going to present uh, to introduce themselves. And as, as Nick had said, my name is Rachel Neff, and I'm the Director of Human Services here in Bucks County. And we're going to, uh, the first person to introduce himself is going to be Walter Bynum. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I, my name is uh, Walter Bynum. I am the co-responder at the Ben Sound Police Department. Thank you, Walter. And I know that we'll be hearing from you throughout the presentation. Uh, next up, Kara Gadinski. Hi, everyone. How are you? My name is Kara Gadinski. I am the co-responder for Falls Township Police Department. Great. Thank you, Kara. And uh, Lieutenant Schumann. How you doing? I'm Lieutenant Fred Schumann uh, with Ben Salem Police Department. I uh, help facilitate whatever Walter needs. Uh, here at the department. And uh, they started the program here and I've been privileged enough to be with it and I'm honored to still be here. Great, thank you, Lieutenant Schumann. Um, I would also like to recognize that Jessica Manzo is another co-responder on our team and uh, she is not presenting today. However, she is housed in Middletown. So she's one of our uh, other co-responders in Bucks County. So uh, we do have a, a PowerPoint that we're going to, to put up to just run through um, some highlights of the co-responder program here in Bucks County. Um, and again, this is who's, who's on the call today. And just to get us started, really, we wanted to share with everyone what the goals are of this program. Um, so our next slide really outlines what the, what the purpose of the program is. We want to, with this model, decrease the time that law enforcement spends in uh, situations that involve human services needs. And then we wanna provide a more effective response to those individuals who are reaching out um, and ensuring that we're connecting them and, and streamlining them to resources in the county that would be more appropriate. And finally, we wanna ensure that when possible that we're diverting individuals who we're working with from getting involved in deeper end criminal justice uh, systems. So those are the overarching goals of the program. And uh, later on in our presentation, we're going to hear uh, how, how we've been doing in terms of meeting some of these goals in, in the first year that the program was underway. Um, and, and as we move to the next slide, uh, just on a very basic level, the, the co-responder model is about caring 
a social worker um, with police in responding to calls. So, so Walter and Kara and Jessica are housed in the police department. And then when appropriate, they are responding to calls um, either in the moment or shortly thereafter with officers. And you're gonna hear more about that as our presentation progresses. Um, just to let everyone know, because this is a newer initiative for Bucks County, um, we, and, and I really uh, wanna recognize that it came together fairly quickly. Um, and you'll see here that in the summer of uh, 2019, uh, leadership throughout the county brought stakeholders together. I think that this was really a leadership opportunity for Bucks County to say, we want to invest in this initiative and we want to move this forward. And it happened quickly. Um, and so a group of stakeholders convene in the summer of 2019. Uh, we're going to talk about who, who that group was in a minute. Um, we uh, set forth those goals that I just outlined. And then uh, we moved quickly to bring on the staff of, of a co-responder team um, to start doing the work. Um, I would just say that, um, as, and as we move to the next slide, um, uh, the police partnership with Ben Salem uh, was, was critical for us to launch this uh, in year one. And recognizing that Ben Salem is the largest police department, there was a, uh, the thinking behind it was how can we get resources to a community where there is a lot of um, potential need and where the, the supports and services can be useful for individuals. So we did work with Ben Salem um, and the county, the county leadership that came together around this um, was, was instrumental in, in moving it forward. So um, you'll see here in terms of those stakeholders that came together, um, this was a vision of Commissioner Marseglia um, and she has shared that and she was one of the key drivers of our co-responder work. So I wanna thank her and recognize that. Um, at the time, Chief Heron in Ben Salem um, was the first police chief to step forward and, and agree to take this on. So I wanna recognize that he was involved. Um, our district attorney, Matt Weintraub was another key stakeholder um, and then that group really got together all these other uh, departments, um, nonprofit providers um, together to think how this could look. So um, the, the work group, this, this work group here um, continued to meet and we brought the program uh, to life in December of 2020. Um, our next slide, um, again, the partnerships, and you're gonna hear about this from Walter um, and Kara and Lieutenant Schumann as the presentation progresses. Um, our partnerships, we can't, we can't do this work without strong partners because this is about connecting people and referring them to more appropriate services um, other than calling 911. And again, you, you, these are just a sampling. Um, NAMI, uh, Lenape, Penn Foundation, Neighborhood First, we have, uh, the, the co-responders have done an excellent job of reaching out and making sure that um, we are, we're connecting with uh, the appropriate partners. And so speaking of partnerships, uh, Lieutenant Schumann, again, at Ben Salem, uh, I can't say enough that this, this partnership obviously would not work without police uh, presence and involvement. And it's, it's really been a pleasure working with Lieutenant Schumann over um, the last year or so that this has been uh, working in Ben Salem. And I just wanted to turn it over to him to allow some perspective to be shared out uh, in terms of how the police are responding to this and other uh, key information that would be helpful for the group to hear. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, to be honest, when this all first came about, Obviously, there was going to be some apprehension from the police. Uh, that was coming from the national narrative. Police officers thought, you know, here it comes. Somebody's going to come in and tell us how to do our jobs. Once the program was explained, we had the opportunity to explain to the officers that, no, they're not coming in to try to tell us how to do our job, but they're there to augment the jobs that we're doing. What was phenomenal was the two people that we... Uh, had come here, Rachel and Walter. Once they came in 
and the officers here started to see that no, they are making a difference. Uh, the officers were dealing with people on a regular basis, folks that even though we knew there were programs out there, you would hear them once in a blue moon at a roll call. Well, with everything that they're supposed to try to recall what to do as far as arrests and everything else, you kind of know that, okay, there's the Department of Aging, yeah, there's children and youth, but you tend to run out of ideas how to deal with people. Rachel and Walter came in and the officers initially, they had quite a few referrals for them just to see, okay, let's see what they can do with these people that we deal with on a regular basis. And in some cases, we're just completely, we're stymied. We didn't know what to do with them anymore. Walter and Rachel came in, they tackled that initial list and they gave feedback to the officers and the officers, it was a give and take. It finally got to a point where that we saw such a, a reduction in how often the officers had to deal with these same people that God forbid Walter or Rachel had a day off. The officers actually were upset because what, well, what do you mean they're not here today? Uh, they've come to, to actually not just respect what they do, but they rely on what they do. So that apprehension, and you're going to see that in just about any police department initially. Uh, Kara may have seen it. Uh, that's something that police officers, if you can show them that you're there to do the right thing for the right reason, and it helps them with their job, they're going to embrace it. We were fortunate here in Ben Salem because well, like Rachel said, we do have a lot of problems here. Uh, we're multicultural. There's, we, we're so close to Philadelphia. We have so many homeless. We have so many people who have so many, a, a variety of problems. The average officer can't handle that. Walter, Rachel, while she was with us, uh, Rachel Augusta, they made a huge difference and they're still making a difference. It's, uh, and I'm sure Rachel Neff will explain uh, originally, Rachel Augusta is no longer here, or Walter is now doing double the amount of work that he did before. Um, they're an important part of the department now, and they're an important part of our community now, and we wouldn't want it any other way. Thank you, Lieutenant Schumann, for sharing out. I know that we're going to come back around uh, later in the, in the presentation. So um, right now, we're going to turn it over to uh, Walter Bynum and Kara Gadinsky. And again, I think this, this program would not be where it is without these fantastic co-responders. So uh, I'm fortunate to, to work with them. Um, and they really, I think, have offered our community a lot of resources and support. So um, with that said, uh, Walter is going to really just share out on some perspectives from what their work entails um, and elaborate on some of the situations that they do get involved in. So Walter, I'm turning it over to you. Yeah, thank you, Rachel. Um, can everyone hear me? Well, I guess. Okay. Um, so just, I mean, just from a co-responder's perspective, um, our main focus is to um, limit the time or interaction law enforcement officials have with individuals who need mental health or social service um, assistance. Um, one of the things that I, from the inception of this program, wanted to do was sort of kind of build relationships with the community members um, so that we can form uh, a bond. Um, they can trust us. Um, they can, you know, come to us, you know, if they need any help, um, if they need resources. Uh, but also, uh, one of the things that um, I found um, to, to sort of kind of happen often was that individuals will be offered um, re referrals and, and, and resources, and they will refuse to take them because they were actually scared. Um, and they, they, you know, they didn't have family to support them. Um, so we kind of assume that role of friend, family, um, to help individuals process uh, what needs to happen. 
uh, but also to support them throughout the, their transition from um, where they're currently at to going through a program, doing the resources, getting the paperwork and all everything else they need in order to um, enroll in a program and then seeing them all the way through. Um, so typically what happens is um, we'll get a referral from uh, a police officer who may have had inter interaction with the individual. Um, there's two things that can happen. Either we can be called out to the scene uh, if it's a dire emergency, or we can just uh, be given a report as a follow-up to follow up with that individual. Um, I'll, just an example of an on-scene issue. Um, we had a young man who um, he eloped from home. Uh, he, had, he had mental health conditions that he eloped from home. Um, and mom, mom, mom and dad, didn't know how to handle it. Police were called. Um, so instead of the police officer engaging with the individual, um, they radioed to me to come out. Um, I met with the, the mother, I met with the father, and then I engaged with the individual. Uh, we were able to safely get him to Lower Bucks Hospital where he was evaluated. Um, that's one of my success stories because um, after the evaluation, it was determined that uh, mom and dad couldn't fully support him. Um, so through working with um, the county and additional providers, we were able to get this young man into a residential setting to now where he lives. Uh, he's healthy, he's safe. Um, he's, he's able to do the things that, that he wants to do. He's able to, to live a fulfillful life. Uh, mom and dad are no longer stressed out. Um, so that was just one of, I guess, the success stories that we have had thus far. Um, the other is just a follow-up where uh, officers may encounter a person um, and they may say, okay, well, this is not an immediate concern, uh, but you know, this individual may need some resources. So we will usually reach out to that individual uh, via telephone, um, set, up, set up an appointment time to meet with them, um, go out, we'll, we'll you know, let them tell us what is occurring in their lives, and then we'll find the needed resources for them. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's pretty much how both, um, I guess, encounters go with, with the community members. Um, so I'll pass it over to Kira so that she can give you her perspective. Thank you, Alter. Um, so I'm here in Falls Township Police Department. I started here toward the end of December of last year. So I'm still kind of learning, still kind of adjusting. Um, but I, I mean, so far from the perspective of, of my response to calls is, is similar, if, if not the same as, as Walter's perspective. Um, I either, sometimes an officer will call me directly to assist with an individual at a scene once it's determined that, that it's safe, um, or you know, I'll receive a referral with a potential for connection to services, um, whether it happened after hours, um, or whether it was just kind of a quicker follow-up with law enforcement and then kind of a warm handoff to me. Um, building those connections with the community members, I think is really important right now. There's a lot of individuals who really kind of lack those natural supports that maybe a lot of us have. Um, and sometimes folks don't really know where, where to turn to um, and law enforcement sometimes is that first contact. Um, so really kind of bridging that gap and being able to be a resource for people, even if it's just to talk or vent when they're feeling overwhelmed. Um, you know, my goal with people is really to kind of get to know them, but also help them feel empowered to make those decisions. Um, I think Walter put it really well. There's sometimes some, we're met with some resistance and hesitation to engage in services or you know, make decisions that may enhance the quality of people's lives. But I think the most important thing when you're making those initial contacts is to meet people where they're at, you know, give them a sense of comfort and, and freedom to share. Um, because a lot of times what you find is the presenting issue that maybe you're responding to is a little bit more complex than what it is at face value. So I think it's important to really kind of understand people get to know them and work through those processes. So 
you know, I think we'll kind of touch on it a little bit at the end of this presentation, but really, you know, bringing that community awareness, you know, helping others within our individual fields and departments be aware of what services are out there and also helping them, you know, get to a point where they're able to make those decisions and connect them with services. So um, I'm really happy to be here. I'm really excited about this program. Um, I'm really grateful that I've been given this opportunity. Um, I work Chief uh, Nelson Whitney is the chief of police here. And when I first started, I think he said it the best. There's a lot of opportunity for creativity, innovation, um, and a way to kind of change how we respond to individuals who may be facing challenges a little bit differently than, than what we know. So um, I appreciate everyone's time and for taking the time to listen about the program. And I look forward to, you know, what the future holds for the position. Great, thank you, Kara. And thank you, Walter, for sharing out some perspectives. Um, on our next slide, we are, um, again, and, and I'm gonna turn this back to Walter, to, to walk through what we've learned from the first year uh, with, this, with this program. And uh, we have engaged with Patricia Griffin, uh, who's an outside evaluator to help us capture information. Um, internally at the county, we're tracking information and then uh, Patricia Griffin is, is analyzing it for us. And so some of those goals that I had outlined at the beginning, um, we're gonna walk through to, to look at in terms of uh, how we're meeting some of them and, um, and just give you a basic sense in terms of how many, you know, how many individuals have been served um, and, and what other impacts we've seen over the first year. So I think Walter is, um, is going to lead us off with, with some of this information. Yeah, so as everyone can see on the chart, um, the first year of the program, uh, we actually um, interacted with 212 people. Um, now that, that ranged from homeless services, mental health, dis you know, mental health uh, disorders, um, uh, what else? Social service needs, uh, addiction. Um, so we sort of kind of covered the entire gamut of the social service mental health um, needs group. Um, we interacted with individuals as young as seven uh, and as old as, I think the oldest one uh, was 89, I believe. Um, so of, of those 212 people, approximately 25% um, was labeled high utilizers. Uh, what high utilizers are, are individuals who consistently call um, 911, um, I guess in times of need. And what we found out from, from that, um, the high utilizers calls was that most were calling just to have general conversations with dispatchers. Um, so what we did was once we, once we identify the high utilizers, um, myself and Rachel Augusto, um, we will call those individuals, uh, we will go meet with them, uh, and we would just have them call us instead of calling 911 to have general conversations. Um, and I guess I, I did say before where, because a lot of them didn't have natural supports, um, they were rely on uh, outside and paid supports in order to fulfill that need of um, having someone that they could talk to. So Rachel, Augusto and I, we fill that, that void uh, for those individuals. Um, and, and, those, and those individuals, they, those, those individuals had to play three or more calls uh, within a week to um, 911 operators. Um, in, a, in, in the six months post contact, um, with the co-responders, the group represented approximately 20, uh, 2 percent, sorry, of the total number of calls. So that means that it went from 98 percent um, of calls being directed to um, law enforcement officials or the high utilized call 911 to down to 2 percent. Um, and that was, um, you know, just a direct result of Rachel and I reaching out to those individuals and having them call us for support rather than call um, 911. Um, 
We streamline connections to community resources based off individual needs directly and indirectly. Um, during the first six months of the program, uh, referrals were made to 26 human service agencies in the county. Um, by the end of the first year, this number increased to 77 organizations. Um, and I think what we found was that a lot of individuals within uh, Ben Selling didn't realize how many services and supports uh, Bucks County offered. Um, so I think that was also another, um, I guess, positive that this, this program actually gives to the community members is that um, they now know and they now understand that Bucks County has a lot of resources that's available to them. And 99% of the time, it's free. Um, you know, they just need to have insurance uh, and they can receive the services. Um, Within, within the 55% of the cases where an arrest was possible, the individuals were diverted from jail or incarceration. Uh, and that's one of the main focuses of this program is to provide individuals who may have a social service or mental health need, um, divert them from you know, being incarcerated because you know, we, we now understand that if you, if you are offered support um, outside from outpatient services, you will not get the same support inside a county jail or a prison. Um, so that's just, um, I guess, an example of the uh, evaluation highlights uh, from the first year of the Benson Police Department Correspondent Program. Next slide. Um, so this is the volume of calls per month. Um, as you can see, um, the program started uh, November of 2020. Um, so in December, we had 39 calls. And as you can see, they sort of kind of trickled down a little bit. Um, December and January, the colder months are usually, um, we thought would be uh, the months that we got the least calls. It seems like on this chart, it was, you know, we, we got the most calls. Um, so overall, uh, Rachel and I, um, we received a total of 297 calls, um, which included uh, 212 discrete individuals during the period of December 2020 to December 31st, 2021. The volume of calls and the number of individuals contacted by month are reported in, in the figure one. So as you can see, um, the month where we had the least amount of interaction was September of 2021, where we only had six individuals. Uh, next slide. Uh, police officers and co-responder average elapsed time per episode per month. Um, so as you can see, um, Rachel and I spent uh, quite, a, quite a few um, hours with individuals uh, compared to police officers. And that's the aim of the program. The aim of the program is to limit police, uh, I don't want to say contact or interaction with individuals, um, and then, you know, we take over and we spend the bulk of the time providing resources, providing them uh, support, um, and also building relationships. So, you know, December of uh, 2020, um, you know, 200, 221 minutes total um, of interaction with individuals within the community um, compared to police only spending 84 minutes uh, with those individuals. Um, June 2021. Um, Rachel, Rachel and myself, we spent 226 minutes um, interacting with individuals where um, police officers only spent 52. And that may have been just an initial call and they're responding to um, the incident. Um, and the lowest was 19 minutes in October of 2021 um, compared to, you know, Rachel, uh, Rachel and myself spending 165 minutes with them. Um, so as you can see, um, as the time went on, officers spent less time interacting with individuals, which means that they had additional time to respond to, you know, emergent situations and uh, police the public. Um, next slide. Um, so this figure, it shows the contact type. Um, so we have four, four kinds of contact. Um, the first one is follow-up contact, which um, is more so where we get reports and then we're asked to follow up the next day. Um, immediate response request is when we're actually called to the scene um, to help somebody. 
um, or to provide that, that resource and, that, and, and the referrals to either an officer or an individual. And then the information provided um, is where we're just providing information to community members. Um, someone that may call, uh, may have an issue or may need direction on which way to go um, in order to give you know, resources. And non-urgent uh, referrals is more so when we're, um, when we, we may have a call and it may not be an urgent situation, or it may just be a family member just trying to, you know, you know gather information or um, we're planning to meet someone and they give us like a, 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 a week time to meet with them. Um, so as you can see, follow-up contact um, was, you know, was the highest at 42%. Um, Non-urgent follow-up was 30%. Um, the information provided was 6%. And the immediate response request was 29%. Um, next slide. Um, caller six months prior to, to CR follow-up and then the callers after the CR follow-up. And this is the, um, the chart that we had uh, on, I think the first slide that I presented um, where the end result was 2%. So uh, it went from 98% of high utilization to 2% after the, after, after the uh, year end. Um, six month period, it went from 78% of high utilization to 22%. Next slide. Um, what clothing thoughts? Um, Kara and I decided, you know, Kara and I thought that it would be, you know, best to just to give some, I guess, thoughts on our perspective of the program and, and where we think it should go. Um, so for me, um, I think this was well needed um, within communities in Bucks County. Um, I, I think that a lot of times um, community members are suffering in silence um, and they're not given the opportunity to, to receive support. Um, they don't have the information in order to receive support. So therefore they, they usually uh, end up um, in situations that they, pr they pretty much can't get out of. Um, so, I mean, I, I think, you know, for the most part, we have been very successful in building relationships with community members, building relationships with outside stakeholders, um, but also building inner, inner, inner connection relationships with different agencies and um, providing individuals within a community with the supports needed. Uh, Kara? Um yeah, I am to go off of what Walter said, I, I completely agree. Um, I'm really um, passionate about this mission. And we touched earlier on some partnerships um, here at Falls Township Police Department. We're fortunate enough to also partner with Family Service Association, who um, has certified recovery specialists working here as well. Um, for the future of the program, I mean, I'm always willing to learn uh, some of the major conversations I've been having around, especially with the command staff right now is let's let's kind of debrief after certain situations and let's talk about what went well, what didn't go well. You know, we're not here, you know, as as was discussed earlier, we're not here to replace law enforcement. We're not here to tell anybody how to do their job. I wanna be an asset. I wanna be a resource, not only just for our community members, but for law enforcement as well. Um, you know, and I'm going to continue to invest in different trainings, different programs. Um, and I'm hopeful to be able to start here at Falls Township. Um, a newsletter that will go out to law enforcement maybe on a monthly basis to update and highlight certain programs. So that way the information from a law enforcement perspective can be communicated to our individuals as well. Um, you know, like I said, I, I'm just really, I'm happy to be here. I'm excited to see what, what the future holds for the program. And we've made a lot of progress so far. I've only, since I had started in December, I'd say right now I probably have over 20 active cases or so. And then of course, in between then, just general phone calls, general contacts um, that might not require as much, I guess, of the case management piece, but um, certainly built some pretty positive connections so far. And, um, you know, I, I, I hope, I'm hopeful that it will grow and, and be as positive as has been reflected so far. 
As far as the police perspective, I, I want to build off of what Kara and Walt said. Uh, when this program first started, like I said, there was the initial apprehension uh, as far as the national narrative, social workers were going to go out there, they were going to handle the man with the knife, and, and that's what a lot of officers were struggling with. The program came in, we were blessed with the people that we have because there was no template on how to do this it was a learn as you go fortunately we've learned a lot the officers now have somebody in walter or kara that the officer finds the person with the problem whether it's their housing conditions are horrid they have no family they have mental health issues they don't know where to go now we have somebody we can contact, we can bring them in and they get closure with that person, whether it's, they just need somebody to talk to on a regular basis. They're not calling 911 all the time to have somebody just human contact to, to talk to. And that's helping the officers tremendously. Uh, just to kind of touch on why the co-responders time goes up and the officer time goes down. Now the officers realize, hey, we've got Walter or we have Kara. They get the initial information. They find out what their situation is. And then they send the request in, knowing that the follow-up is going to be there. They're accepted. They, they know that the program is going to help these people. And again, they tend to panic or get a little worried when it's a weekend and we don't have the corresponder on, or God forbid you take a vacation day and we don't have the corresponder there, but they know that you're gonna be there the next day or the next week. It's building and it's building in, a, it's building in the correct way. And we wanna make sure it continues to do that. And I think it's going to do so when more and more police departments start to get corresponders in because the officers are beginning to realize we're there to augment each other. We're not there to replace each other. We're, we're supposed to be out there for the same purpose and that's to keep the community healthy as, as much as possible. And knowing that we as a police officer can reach out to our co-responder and they can bring in those different agencies, that definitely helps. It doesn't just take the weight off the officer's shoulders but in some cases, it can also help the co-responder reach back out to us. We were fortunate in that one of the other uh, referral areas we had was the rescue squad. We didn't think of that initially, but they see people that these, the police officers don't see as well. So we could bring their referrals in. And that way, Walter or Kara, they can see these people ahead of time so that it doesn't become a problem. Bringing all this together, Rachel, I want to say thank you for allowing us to be the first agency to start. And we're looking forward to this program expanding. And any, like I said earlier, any way we can help, any way we could talk to other departments or even the public, whatever questions they may have, we're here for you. Lieutenant Schumann, thank you um, for summarizing that for us. And, and Karen, Walter, uh, your presentation was excellent uh, in terms of providing out some perspectives from what you're doing. And then Walter, thank you for walking through all the data from the first year. Uh, I just wanna say that along the lines of, of future growth, um, again, uh, Chief McVeigh in Ben Salem is, is supportive of this initiative because we're in Ben Salem, uh, Chief Whitney, and Chief Bartarella have been fantastic partners. Um, and again, some of the, the first chiefs to step forward to take this on, and we appreciate working with them. And the co-responder program, we are uh, planning to expand into Bristol Township, Bristol Borough, and Tullytown. So there are efforts underway um, to move forward with expansion. And again, I think it's what everyone said. I think that this is a smart investment of community resources for Bucks County. So. Um, again, just really thankful for this for this team. It, it's it's good to work with all of them. Um, they're very smart, dedicated, um, 
compassionate individuals and and I'm so glad they're on our human services team in Bucks County and and Lieutenant Schumann is a police partner. So um, Nick, I think that wraps up where we're at. Awesome. Very good. Well, thank you all. Um, that was a lot more information than I honestly anticipated receiving. <laughs> <laughs> It was really helpful. Walter, I can tell that you're working. Kara, you're probably working as well. Lieutenant Schumann, you're definitely working right now. I can tell. <laughs> now this is, I dress like this every day. <laughs> <laughs> but I just wanted to thank you all for everything that you put into this. And you too, Rachel. I know what the Bucks County office looks like. I know that you're at the office. Um, so midday, thank you for preparing all of this and being here. Um, and um, Walter and Kara, um, I work a lot myself. Just a reminder, please take time for some self-care. <laughs> I know <laughs> I know they um, depend on you, but uh, that that data is is incredible. And you being able to just breeze through it like that just shows that you're dedicated and how much you care. And we appreciate that. We really do. Thank um, you. Absolutely. As a person living with mental illness, and you know, running an advocacy organization, it helps me to sleep a little better at night, knowing that if I ever got sick again um, and needed interaction with law enforcement, that you are there. So it, it, I really appreciate it. I think um, if you're up for some questions, I think the number one question, um, whoever would like to take this, is, is there a plan to expand this to all 39 municipalities? And if so, how can um, CSP, which is our community support program, and NAMI help to advocate for that? Um, Nick, so I'll, I'll just briefly respond. I, I think what we're seeing at the county level, again, is that this is a, a great investment for our communities. I know that our county leadership wants to continue expanding. I know that we're already in talks with other police departments. Um, so, um, in terms of moving forward an initiative that works, I want to support that as much as I can. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that the county leadership, uh, and our human services team is embracing that as well. So, mm -hmm. um, the plan is to continue to expand, um, and we're certainly doing that throughout the remainder of this year. Um, awesome. Very good. And I know little by little, just to make sure that each program is quality and it's it's effective. Um, is there anything that we can do? Um, I know that these programs aren't free. <laughs> so is there a way that we should advocate to for dollars? Is there a way that you know we should speak to other departments? How do you think we can best help? Um, well, and again, the some of the, the ways in which we're funding uh, the co-responder, Donna Duffy Bell, I think I saw her on the call, mm -hmm. the Community Mental Health Services Block Grant, we've been able to uh, apply for funding through the state uh, a year ago to be able to bring on a portion of the team in Falls and Middletown. So I think advocacy there mm -hmm. um, ha has been important. We're, we're looking at other uh, grants as well. Um, that we can apply to uh, and hopefully receive because again, it's staffing. I mean, we need staff, so we we need resources to support that. Mm -hmm. um, so I would just say, I think um, continuing to let our you know county leadership know how important it is. Um, and uh, you know, at the state level, again, that was funding that came from OMSAS um, and PCCD is another funder. So I think that, we're seeing a lot more interest again on the federal level um, to say how do we prioritize initiatives like this. So we're we're going to continue to go after uh, funding streams when they're available. Awesome. And um, Malcolm just asked too, what can the advisory board do to help? We, I think maybe we can all work together to make sure that everyone knows just how important this initiative is. And when we have our block grant meetings. Um, which will be coming up. Make sure that you attend. NAMI will put those out. CSP will put those out. And um, we'll be there to let people know that it's important. Um, and there was another question that was submitted. Um, and I, I think this might be for co-responder, whoever would like to answer. 
as an EMT, we have an EMT on the call. Um, what is the interaction like between the department, the co-responders, and say EMTs? Or I know you touched on it a little bit, Fred. Well, like I said, um, we had uh, the, the chief of the local rescue squad had reached out because in a lot of the cases, their squads are going out, they're getting the, the medical calls, and they're going into these homes and they're getting calls for people with psychiatric issues or they're just showing up and uh, the people were in poor health because of their living conditions where the police would not be involved initially. Mm -hmm. So they had thought, well, they knew we had the program here. We looked at that as, okay, this is another opportunity to get referrals where we could bring the co-responders in. Mm -hmm. uh, just to see whether it's something that Walter or Rachel at the time could help with, or whether it was just um, something out of their venue completely. So we were able to partner up that way. And this way, once they had the follow up, Walter now can directly get back to the chief and let them know what help is being done at that time. Mm -hmm. So again, it's the feedback. And if the police have to get involved, Again, we refer it over to Walter. So that way it, it's the give and take of the information. It is helping uh, in some cases where the officer will go in, they'll see things from the police officer's perspective, whereas an EMT or paramedic can go in and they'll see something from a whole different perspective that might help Kara or Walter at the time, Rachel, because they see it from a, a different set of eyes, a medical trained type of uh, outlook. That could give them, I don't know, maybe a, a, a different way of handling the situation. Things the officer might miss, the EMT or the paramedic might see differently. And any situation like that, any different view is going to be helpful. Mm -hmm. Walter? Yeah, and I agree. Um, so it's the partnership with uh, EMT and Rescue has been great. Um, we have direct contact. Um, with the EMTs and with the fire department um, in Ben Salem. So um, when we do have, you know, joint cases, we're constantly communicating with each other. Um, we're providing each other resources, uh, information as to better support the individual. Um, so, I mean, so far it has been, it has been good, has been great actually. Um, and I mean, I really have no complaints. Very good, awesome. I think any way to get people the support they need is a good is a good thing. Yeah. Um, to circle back for a second to um, the way that we can help to advocate, um, Donna Duffy Bell is on the call. She's our mental health administrator. Um, the call, the Zoom, whatever you know. <laughs> um, advocacy around increasing the base funding would help, and we are actually. Our second event in this series, we didn't announce it yet, but it'll be on uh, March 22nd at 10 a.m. if you'd like to join us to learn about the, the budget as it relates to the amount of services that we're able to provide and how we can work together to advocate for an increase in that base funding, because that's what we use to fund all the programs related to behavioral health in, in Bucks County. So. Um, we're set for a bit of an increase, but we need to advocate for that and possibly some more so that we can do more of this. <laughs> so join us on the 22nd if you are able to. I will put that information out shortly. Um, other questions. Um, police use of force incidents involve people in a mental health crisis often. Have you found that co-response can de-escalate crisis situations so that the need for forcible response can be prevented or reduced? Is it okay if I take this one? Sure. Yeah. Just to start, actually just to start. Um, again, that kind of goes back to, uh, I guess the national perspective of what was gonna go on. Uh, first of all, we're not gonna let, we're not gonna call Walter out if somebody has a knife the officers that we have in Ben Salem, and I know Falls Township as well, and Middletown. Our officers, along with our use of force training, we are taught verbal de-escalation. That's their first and foremost thing. They try to de-escalate it at the time so that that person is not an active threat. 
they, they put the knife down, they put the gun down. If it's a situation where the person, it's a barricaded subject with mental health issues, the biggest thing is the safety of the, uh, the surrounding community. And then to make sure that that person is okay. Once that person is no longer an active threat and they're in custody, we'll bring Walter, uh, we'll let him know what's going on. If it's a situation where the person was suicidal or homicidal, but it was because of mental health issues, there may be charges on them, but there's also the mental health follow-up. We always make sure whether it's, uh, well, in a case like that, it would be a 302, an involuntary type committal. We also are fortunate in Bucks County where they take that into consideration when it comes time for actual, uh, the, within the court itself. If it's a person that they're going to be in and out, we have Walter, we can refer that person and he can do additional follow-up. Mm -hmm. Part of the beauty of this, we won't allow our, our co-responders in on what's called a hot scene, but we have had a reduction in the number of those because we have the program. Like I said, the early referrals from the officers, hey, this person is acting a little bizarre. It might be somebody that Walter could talk to. We're short circuiting it before it gets to the crisis stage. Uh, the nature of this, uh, you're always gonna have that one person somewhere out there, they're having the worst day of their life and they're going to act out. Uh, some of them act out horrifically. Some of them just start to act out where they're disturbing the public. Like Walter said, if they're just disturbing the public, we don't necessarily need to arrest them. We get them calmed down initially, and then Walter takes over. If it's something where it was horrific, again, Walter, uh, and at the time, Rachel could take in after everything was done to make sure that that person and the community is safe. But we would never, ever bring them in on a, a hot scene where there's a chance that they're going to get hurt. Uh, that's our job still. We do train our officers to try to de-escalate the scene. Mm -hmm. What helps is the fact that we have them to do the follow-up, which prevents it from occurring later. Or like I said, short-circuiting it before it ever gets to the crisis stage. Yeah, and just to piggyback on uh, Lieutenant Schumann, um, I think, you know, because the officers are CIT trained, mm -hmm. they, they, they're able to identify situations where we may be more useful than actually using force mm -hmm. to try, you know, to try to get someone to comply. Um, there have been several incidents um, or calls that, that we have had where the officers may have said, you know what, this individual is, a, you know, I clearly know that this person has a mental health disorder. So can you come talk to this individual? Um, even if the individual may be verbally aggressive um, and sort of kind of defiant of, you know, the orders or um, the support of a police officer. So we have had instances where we had to come in, we had to use um, our expertise to assist in calming a person down or, you know, having a person get back to baseline so that they can receive the help. Um, so I, I think, you know, that's, what the aim of the program is for. Mm -hmm. um, and so far, um, and I, I don't see it changing anytime soon. It, it definitely has been, you know, going in that direction where we're being called out instead of force, you know, having to be used mm -hmm. uh, with individuals with mental health disorders. Good. And that's what, that's what helps me sleep better at night. <laughs> it does. Um, and thank you both. Um, another question. Are County 911 dispatchers able to identify these situations and route calls appropriately that way? Or how does that work? Is that part of this, this scenario? Uh, generally what'll happen, um, usually most people when they're having a bad time uh, in Bucks County, 911 is easier to call and they may, even if the dispatcher says oh, to, to themselves, this is something that a co-responder should probably go to, they're going to either dispatch us or the rescue squad to go on out initially. Um, and I, I don't believe we have it set now where the 911 operator could just send the call right to Walter. Um, 
Yeah, it, it would still have to go through the police department or the rescue squad. Okay. Yeah. All right. And next question. Um, any data about patterns in terms of racial or ethnic prevalence? Do you keep track of that or no? Yes, we, we yeah. actually do keep track of it. Um, uh, Pat Griffin actually sent us the data for that. We didn't include it in the, stat, in the, uh, in the PowerPoint slide. So my apologies, but um, that's definitely something that we can, um, I guess, provide um, in a future meeting. Sure, perfect. All right. Um, who is handling the uh, referrals between social services before? Um, can we enhance the system um, that was in place instead of creating a whole new co-responder system? Um, would that be more cost effective? Was a was a question. You mean before the co-responder program started? Mm -hmm. Yep, before the res responder program. Um, well, part of how it was being handled uh, was each individual police department, you would have to try to get the officer to remember what programs were out there. Mm -hmm. And the sad thing with that is, unlike it, most people have the impression uh, police works like television where the officer never goes home, they work 24 seven, and they can stick with one case forever. And that's not the situation. That's where the disconnect was coming. You might have an officer come in where they're doing a great job with that person and then they're off for two days and that person slips between the cracks. Uh, they will not remember all the different agencies that were out there. This program, and correct me if I'm wrong, Rachel, it was started because of those people falling through the cracks. We needed somebody who could come in where, okay, I'm dealing with you today. I'm off because I'm on vacation next week. Good luck. No, now I know Walter or at the time Rachel was going to take over and get them hooked into the different programs that are out there, get them that are available for them. Uh, the program, they, they had the foresight to see that it was needed. Mm -hmm. It was established. It is cost effective for the number of people that are being helped as opposed to the um, over usage of police, fire, EMS. And the problem wasn't being fixed. At least now, the bulk of it is being fixed. Mm -hmm. And Lieutenant Schumann, I I agree with you. And I would just say that I think um, from where I'm seeing things, from you know, a multidisciplinary approach is is a is a healthy response yeah. to things. I think we have social workers in schools. We have social workers in hospitals. We're putting social workers with police again. I I think that this is something that um, we're learning more about and we're seeing that it's a, an effective approach. And so, again, it's not to replace what the police are doing, um, but if it's a, a better way for us to kind of wrap services around and get people into the correct um, uh, supports needed, that, that that's something we should explore. So that's just another quick thought. Yeah, absolutely. I, on a personal level, uh... I can bring this up, a, a case that Walter, I brought him in on, uh, elderly couple within my neighborhood. They had a plumbing issue. Their house was flooded. They called 911 because they didn't know what else to do. Police officer came out, saw the condition of the house, knew that I was in the neighborhood, but also knew that I helped with the co-responder program, gave me a phone call. I went in, saw the situation, we brought Walter in. He came in, he interviewed the gentleman, saw that obviously they were in dire straits. Family lived out of state. There was nobody close by. We had a plumber in the next day. Department of Aging came in, got both of the people to the hospital, in the hospital, and then to nursing homes for respite care. Prior to this, it would have been the officer just would have been able to go out there and say they need a plumber and that's it. Mm -hmm. Now you have two people in their eighties, one with advanced dementia and the other one unable to care for her, that are now being cared for, but it's because of this program. Mm -hmm. You can't, I don't think you can really put a price tag on that. And, yeah. you know, um, in terms of mental health, everybody has mental health. If you're a human being with a brain, you've got mental health. 
Um, this year, since the pandemic started, I've seen my brother um, go through a mental health crisis. Um, my sister struggles and I myself struggled. And if you struggle or you experience a mental health emergency, you deserve a mental health response. Thank goodness our police officers are trained. You know, thank goodness they're there and, and doing their jobs. Um, but I got to tell you, it, it, a mental health response to a mental health emergency is having a co-responder come out and de-escalate the situa situation, sit and talk with you, and not only just sit and talk with you, but then respond again if, if need be. Follow up um, to make sure that you're okay and that you're involved in the services that they referred you to. Um, so a mental health response is a human response. And so, and that's what people deserve. Uh, I, abs I firmly believe that and we'll support this program as NAMI and CSP um, and anything that we can do in the way of being, you know, uh, support to you all and referral source. Um, when people need to talk and Walter, you work 150 hours a week and so do you, Kara, um, send them to our warm line if they wanna talk. Um, anything that we can do to support that, that's, I think, the purpose of today's um, information session. You know, if there's anything that we can do to support this program in Bucks County, because this is what people deserve, you just let us know. Thank you. Well done. And thank you. Karen said, what a great success story. Well, Karen, thank you for all you do at the NAACP and to um, promote programs like these, too. I'm glad that you joined us as well. <laughs> Any last minute questions before we wrap up? I know we're two minutes over the hour. Um, if you oh, do, wow. enter them into the chat. And if not, I will thank all of you for joining us and for doing this for us. We'll make this available. Um, we're proud of you too, Malcolm. <laughs> so anything that you need, let us know. And this will be made available on our social media and YouTube channel. And uh, look out for that. But thank you all. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Fred. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, thank you Walter. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Thanks so much, Nick. Take right. care, everyone. Take care. You all be safe. Please. Absolutely. Have a great day.